Welcome to Directionally Correct, a people analytics podcast with Cole and Scotty. Today, as a guest, it's me, Hamilton Pies, Senior Network Catalyst at Roche. Thanks to our sponsors, Polynode. Harness the full power of organizational network analysis with Polynode. With one-click data integrations and built-in relationship-based surveys, Polynode enables people analytics practitioners to move from data to insights faster. To learn more and see why Polynode is trusted by some of the most innovative companies in the world today, book a demo at polynode.com slash directionally correct. I think, I think you've been dethroned, Scott. I think. I, yeah. <laughs> We're going to get you to record all our intros now, Hammerson. <laughs> How's it going, Hammerson? I, I think we met quite some time ago, but... Uh... Did we? I, I, I think probably on like a call for Polynode actually, or I, I saw yeah. you or I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I know you from your work, uh, reading your, your publications at HBR. That, oh, that's how I know awesome. you. Awesome. That's for sure. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I, yeah. So it's nice, nice being here and nice to meet you guys. I usually listen to the podcast when I'm driving somewhere. So it's really nice <laughs> to see you guys on the screen. I, I, I haven't uh, watched the YouTube. It's just because most of the time I'm driving, so. This is yeah. how it's made, man. <laughs> this, this is it. Well, Hemerson, you're you're based in Switzerland, but I don't think you're from Switzerland, right? No, I'm from Brazil. Um, based in Switzerland for 13 years, and but I end up working in 11 other countries uh, through my career as well. But Switzerland is the longest place I have been, not counting Brazil, where I grew up, so. It's like feel like home now, Switzerland. What part is what was your favorite? Ah, so which part? I, I'm in the north of Switzerland, Basel. But, but today it's Friday, six o'clock. I'm actually in the mountains in the, in the south of Switzerland. So it's just three hours to cross the country. My favorite part of Switzerland uh, is are the mountains and the lakes. I I like both. So in the summer I'm scuba diving in the lakes. In the winter I'm snowboarding on the mountains. That's that's life. Switzerland's absolutely magical. Like you, you, you cross the border, magical. and all of a sudden you're like crystal clear lakes, and they're like this sort of like pale blue. It, like, it shouldn't exist. It really shouldn't exist on Earth. Yeah, it's just missing the sea. That yeah, is called par- it would be called paradise, you know. If there was a sea. <laughs> <laughs> now, is, is Switzerland the one that have like the guys that dress up like knights that protect the banks, or am I making that up? The Swiss Guard. Swiss Guard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, 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 they protect the, the Pope. The Pope, uh, okay. The Vatican. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They uh, selected, um, um, it's a very strict selection process. And uh, for life, uh, they, I mean, the Swiss Guard is, is loaned by the Swiss government to the Pope. If, if a majority is, Chris, is Christian, but not a majority is not Catholic. Um, mm. So it's interesting combination, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, you mentioned scuba diving. Um, like, is that like big in Switzerland? I didn't. I, when I think of Switzerland, I don't think like, oh, this is the scuba diving capital of the world or something. I don't know. Tell me more. No, just a hardcore divers. Uh, it's it, we would dive in the lakes. I organize trips around the world as well, but most most of the activities are on the, in the lakes, and you do, you see nothing, and it's super cold. So it's really it's really <laughs> nothing like, to see, and you freeze your butt off. <laughs> Yeah, it's mostly for the process, you know, the training and uh, the techniques and uh, it's more for training. But so it, there is a good uh, community of uh, scuba dive. There are several clubs around um, the whole Switzerland. Uh, Germany also is very big, um, hardcore divers, but it's not a tourist destination for scuba diving. <laughs> what they do have in Switzerland is like the lakes will feed into the town and people will get these like water bags they'll throw all their stuff their gear their phone their towels everything into a bag and they'll like jump off a bridge and like float for like miles it, yeah it's, this is... it's absolutely incredible and it's, yeah, it's not like it's like going by slow it's like i don't know four or five p- feet per second like it, it's it's moving oh. it's moving yeah. and it's, it's absolutely incredible to view yeah, the, in the Rhine, which it runs just behind the office at Roche, the two towers. Uh, people in the summer, people would finish work, uh, like five o'clock, six o'clock. It's still sunny. Um, put the 
put their clothes inside a, a floating bag and jump in the in the Rhine and go with the flow, get out on the other side, um, downstream, probably 20, 30 minutes later, have a beer, grill a sausage, and then go home. <laughs> it's a better life. It really is. It's a better <laughs> life. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, are you keeping up with your uh, New Year's resolutions, Emerson? I'm, I don't do resolutions. I, I, I just have a theme for the year. But I have a question for you about New Year's resolution. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Based on your yeah, last podcast of uh, the last year. I think it was the last one for 2023. That you guys talking about uh, New Year's resolution. And uh, I, I, I was very intrigued, Scott, by your project of building Harry Potter live oh, portrait yeah. programming. And I was curious, if you had to do one from Cole, which kind of fun, <laughs> funny movements we would pick up there? What, what we would program there that is cold characteristic mo cold movements? Cold characteristics. Well, 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 a quick update. Uh, I went on Amazon and bought a, it was like a, a self-contained like tripod, light ring. And you still kind of stick your phone right there. And it was like mm -hmm. $18. It really wasn't that expensive. And uh, I went home for the holidays and I got uh, my parents and my sister and I brought it back to Seattle and uh, I got some friends. So I, I think I have like six, seven people now. And I just, I put them in front of the camera and everyone's fucking freaked out when I do this. And I'm like, <laughs> sit, sit there for four minutes, you know, just, you can look around, but you don't try not to say anything and, you know, kind of like uh, just hang out and they're like, I don't know how it's going to turn out. So currently I have a collection of videos of various folks. I need to find a monitor. And I need to like you know do some other stuff, uh, but well we're, we're we're getting there. But Cole, let, let me let me think. I, I think Cole's like kind of a, <laughs> Cole needs like I, he gives me like Henry the Eighth vibes. Like he needs like a <laughs> like a lion, like sort of like mane around him or something like that. <laughs> Wasn't Henry the Eighth like a psycho? Or maybe yes. I'm making it up. Yeah, he was a psychopath. <laughs> uh, but I'm not saying that you're a psychopath. I'm saying like you just look like one. <laughs> Okay. Well, fair enough. Or, or it could be made to look like one anyway. Yeah. You you brought you provide the garb and I'll I'll do whatever you want me to do. Have you uh, ever, this is not like related, but um you were seeing this is like a phenomenon, I guess a few years ago, where they would have these videos of people that would just have to look at each other's face for like five minutes and like you couldn't look away, you just had to look at the other person's face. You put them two people facing each other. And they would always start crying. <laughs> and I feel like that what you're having people do, like looking at a camera, you know, just for an extended period of time, it's just not something that happens naturally in yeah. human existence. And so I bet you, you get really weird reactions to it, you know? Well, this is one of the theories that uh, people think is the cause of like Zoom fatigue or burnout mm -hmm. because you're sitting in front of a camera for that long, like staring at someone's face. Did You just don't do that in natural life, especially sort of that physical distance yeah. you know and they think it like it really causes uh uh you know fatigue in that way um so i mean like i could definitely i don't i, don't, I, I can't imagine having a mental breakdown <laughs> like i start crying like looking at somebody well, i think it came from like a place of empathy but what my point is I, I don't think if you would have asked any of the people who participated before they did it that they would break down and start crying during the middle of it right just like um, staring into someone's soul yeah, it's like you're staring into someone's soul, kind of, and uh, and I, I suspect having a video camera just watch you for a while while you're not doing anything, it's like the most self conscious time of your life. Uh, I, I'll give you like a, a rapid review of what's gone on. So people are really kind of freaked out, like for the first like fifteen thirty seconds, and then they mm -hmm. they kind of settle into it. Of course, yeah. I'm I I will stand behind the light ring so they have something to look at. I should really give them like a TV or something to watch. Uh, but you know, they look around. <laughs> My mother could not handle it. She just started like talking to the camera. I was like, okay, mom, <laughs> let's, let's chill out. Uh, maybe maybe oh, we'll come you, back and circle back. We we're in the second week of January. And you already work on your 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 project. That's that's impressive. <laughs> I I I am trying to be. You know, it's it's like every New Year's resolution. Early on, everyone's at the gym. <laughs> Get it done. You know, so you try to make progress as quickly as you can. Yeah, that's cool. But like, cool. yeah, I, I, I will give I will give you an update when I when I uh, have some sort of finished product. 
what what I, what I deal with right now is uh, all the time people have monitors. Like I need to get rid of this monitor. I need, I, I don't, I don't need this monitor. You, you, I'm trying to give away a monitor. Now I can't find anybody that's giving away a monitor because I don't want to buy I, I do things on the cheap, you know, but like I no no one's giving away. So like if anyone out there has a monitor, they don't want anymore. Bigger the better. I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Super distinctly, Scott, you said people with multiple monitors are less productive. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to see you come around to the dark side. <clears throat> well, I need it just for this project. Right. I, I need it just for this project. But of course, it's not very productive either. So we'll see. I don't know. Cool. Be, well, Hemerson, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today is just because I feel like you're doing some really incredible work in the ONA space. And I know you and Scott both are just, just phenomenal leaders in that area. And I don't know, do you want to just talk about like how did, I guess I'm just curious. How did you find out about the concept of ONA, and then maybe we'll build into kind of some of the cool things that you're doing at Roche. Yeah. So the the, the challenge we started when um, we initiated a transformation program at Roche, and uh, the first question that came to mind is that how could we roll out these? Can we find the people that have already exhibiting uh, the behaviors that we expect to see. Um, we would assume as well that people um, have a certain degree, a closer degree of influence on people that uh, work closer to them, or tr they trust. And how how would then we map this? Then that's when I start looking to the network, network science. And in, in the beginning it was uh, not that easy to find who ha could do that, could help with that. Um, so that was the trigger. Basically, we wanted to find uh, people that were already trusted in the organization um, so that we could um, engage with those um, those people and listen to them and also um, get their feedback um, or um, count on their help as well, actually count on their help to uh, spread uh, or convince others, let's say influence others or inspire others towards the vision um, of the change that we wanted to roll out. That was back in 2019 when I started looking into that. Then uh, from that point on, I uh, was uh, determination, a little bit more like Scott's project, you know? You have a goal, <laughs> start working <laughs> on it, uh, bring us as, as, uh, as quick as, as possible to reality. Um, but it took us a while actually to, to, to make it happen. So, you know, all the, all the barriers and restrictions in the organization to get, you know, data, to get, uh, to run a survey a network analysis that back in 2020, then we had COVID, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> just, just in the beginning of the year. Um, so, and there was the concern of uh, some leaders that what would come out of that uh, network analysis, uh, organization network analysis. Would it show um, dysfunction? Would show um, silos in the organization? Would show them in silos, <laughs> uh, not disconnecting the organization? So there are also the resistance and fear um, on rolling out that. But fortunately, we, then we went through. We managed to get uh, to get it. Um, um, the first net active network analysis we did uh, was using survey and we collect the data. We didn't have any, any tool to, to analyze, uh, to consolidate. So we, we had to do um, count with help of other people to do that analytics, um, um, more or less, I would say manually. Um, but at, to the point that we are today where we roll out the change, we now have um, a, a structure to, um, we basically create a structure to collect data um, that then can provide us passive uh, network analysis. Um, and uh, we can then uh, infer that about that data. The last one we did with Polynode was, uh, we are regularly using Polynode now for a year now, where we're collecting this passive data, but we want to validate whether that passive data was um, reflection of reality. So we run another active uh, network analysis um, in November, October, November last year. Uh, and then we are comparing if the results of the active network analysis um, um, confirm or or discredit the the data we have from the passive uh, data. Wow, you're you're getting like really deep. Like you you guys are 
full on into this going from like an uh, just a, a kernel of an idea and like you sell it to leadership then conducting active network analysis then well, what, what kind of passive data are you collecting on individuals so so one of the changes we want to introduce and that's not a question it's we wanted um the organization to um rethink of the form of work so we have we're operating in 89 countries, um, 13,000 employees, and this is only the pharma commercial part that I, I take care. Um, and what happens in, I need, sorry, Scott, I need to set a little bit of business context. Sure, sure. Uh, what happens is uh, because the people, the, 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 the healthcare system is very locally oriented, so no pol policies are local policies, doctors are local, hospitals are local. Uh, a lot of the work takes place, a lot of the collaboration takes place locally. So our team or commercial teams or medical teams um, are engaged in introducing a new product in the market or they are supporting um, the um, um, scale up of a new therapy. No, new therapy. Um, they would engage locally. And then what do you happen when we are dealing with 89 countries is that even though we have the same innovation technology to disseminate everywhere, these skills are not equally distributed. So there are countries that will not have um, conditions even to recruit people with certain skills because there isn't, uh, that skill is not available in the country. So for them, it's much harder to um, support the local um, patients or the, the healthcare system with only the skill pool they have. So our intention was to create a a structure where the skill could or people could bring these skills, whatever they from places that uh, we have abundant skills to places that have um, less skills without um, impact on people mobility. So not everyone wants to uh, is mobile. Not not every talent is um, willing to relocate, but they are willing to um, lend the skill sets to um, for short projects um, to support. Um, colleagues in other countries or, or objectives in, in other in other affiliates or we call in other countries in other markets. So in order to do that, um, we wanted to create a space where people could um, launch challenges uh, or opportunities or initiatives in a platform, and people could then re um, sign up for that. So basically, we wanted people to start collaborating um, across border and across functions. Um, more than they were doing before. Uh, and that's the data we're collecting today. So the, the structure, we, the change we did and the platform that we introduced it, uh, enables us to, to see what is happening in terms of needs. People raise the needs that we need, uh, we need a digital marketing specialist uh, or we need to develop um, a campaign for a launch of the product of ophthalmology in country X and then people from that have that skill set, they would um, sign up for that project. So now we can map uh, the work, the units that are forming at, around the need of work, and uh, we can map the skills that are flowing to that work and the skills needed for that work. And we can understand um, uh, people through the active network, we can also understand um, those people that are critical to the collaboration of individuals. We can see also that from the passive but we confirm through the active network and I. So basically we are mapping, we, we are having a, an X-ray of the, the dynamism of needs that are not fulfilled in the organization or have a lack um, in some, certain regions and how that is flowing or not flowing um, for that part of the organization. Well, that's fascinating. I'm wondering, one of the things that um, I got to attend a, a, a webinar you did recently, Hammerson, uh, with Polynode, where you were talking about some of the work that you got to do um, using ONA. And one of the things that came up, and I've never heard of any other companies that were doing this, is because you guys are so focused on using ONA for collaboration and kind of bridging barriers that may have not previously been bridged, you're actually sharing ONA data directly with employees. And I very, very rarely hear, or I, I say rarely, I've never heard of anybody doing that. And so can you talk specifically about how that has gone about and how you were able to be that progressive in this space of using that type of data and scaling it directly to employees? So we, we just started with that uh, 
um, approach as well um, called. Mm -hmm. it, it comes also from the principle that we have. This, it, we want people to have the autonomy. They have the intelligence that they need to make the decisions that they need to make. We also found um, um, back then in 2020, when we did the first network analysis, we did interview with people that are central to the collaboration of a specific of clusters or they are building bridge between between clusters or silos. And we try to understand what are the um, behaviors that um, that actually they 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 used, how why they were so important um, to the collaboration of, of other individuals. And we invited a group of um, them to design what would be the principles and the conditions for enable uh, better collaboration or better co and uh, um, more effective collaboration across border. And the principles, one of the principles they came up with is, is super simple. You, you, it's the, the need need to be visible, so the, the, the project can be visible. The skills need to be visible, the skills that are needed and the skills people have, um, but also need to have a transparency about what's going on. So, we, and to, to fulfill this third, basically to fulfill these three requirements, no better way than actually provide the visibility to the employees about uh, um, the collaboration that's taking place using uh, network maps or and, and the data that we, we have about their the collaboration. We also provide, um, becomes very, very, very um, strikingly visible what is the lack of some skills that we have, uh, overload that some people are facing because the, the rare skills that they, they pursue. Um, and we also work in, in, in helping them to develop capabilities to, to deal with that overload, you know? because once you remove those constraints or those barriers of, of the traditional structure of a job description where people only have to work on demands required by the line manager, now the demand is coming from anywhere. It's available and people can find <laughs> the reputation. We also saw called that the reputation spreads faster and people that are participating in these projects are four times more likely to be non, to be recognized by these skills and capabilities. And because people are working multiple projects, that reputation goes faster, is spread wider in the organization. So then it's a new set of skills um, that people would have to acquire. But the best way we find to make that, um, to give them the tools and the, the, um, the information they can decide by themselves where to, put their fort, uh, which projects to say no, because there are alternatives that they could um, work better. It's by providing uh, the full information um, straight away. I think that that's one of the myths that people have about collaboration. Uh, they, they look at like a network map or, you know, just like look at their, their colleagues and be like, well, that person's really uh, extroverted. And that, that and they're, they're just like very charismatic. That That's why they can make their way to the center of the network or they can influence this sort of stuff. But people have a choice in the network to make themselves more central or more uh, periphery if they want to. Uh, like, look at Cole. Like, you know, he, he made a choice like a couple of years ago to like, hey, I want to make a name for myself. I'm going to go start meet with a bunch of people. And therefore, he's become the popular, handsome, glorious figure that he is. <sighs> <laughs> but but in, in, in reality so weird. <laughs> yeah uh but in reality it's, it's a skill just like if you want to learn python you go out and like you take some training courses you learn how to do python you know like it, it sounds like uh your company has given people the uh the the training to uh learn how to put themselves out there and you know make their way in the network yeah yeah and and uh, they can also find uh, what we see as well, um, they can use the same data to find colleagues that have this, have worked already in similar yeah. um, project. They have, sometimes it's even that technical and pragmatic, Scott, like who else is doing this, have the same challenge and already working the same thing or who has worked already. Um, and oh, this person is, I don't know this person, but this person worked with, with Cold, which I worked in yeah. previous project. So let me, let me reach out to them, you know, like, let, Maybe Cole can introduce me, and then we can, um, I can get that that person help in the challenge I have now. And so I, I think that's one of the one of the fallacies surrounding network analysis as well. That like it, it's only good for one thing, like I, I e like identifying influencers. So these people are key in the network, and we're gonna go tap them, and they're gonna you know disseminate information or whatever, and it kind of dies on the vine. But 
once you have that network map, th there's all sorts of things that can happen, i.e. like identify other folks that uh, have a common set of behaviors that relate to a common set of outcomes, you know, identify these uh, figures that have gone through it before, uh, org planning, org design, like you kind of mentioned on there before. I mean, it's just like a wealth of information that comes from this one data set. Agreed. Yeah. Well, and I'll say one thing um, too here, and, and I'd love to get your perspective on it too, Hammerson, is the differences in the richness of data that you can get from active or passive techniques. Because usually you're getting you're getting similar data, but it has very different implications and richness in terms of the qualitative aspects of it. Do you want to talk about like how you've utilized the strengths of both of those kind of collections? So one one thing that it would uh, help us it's uh, having the passive enables us to um, when we run the active to be more um, specific in the questions that we want to ask because we already have the pre-work, right? And uh, for instance, we want to understand what was the impact of the projects and how people uh, felt about participating in some projects. So it's much easier with the passive data. We already can uh, ask people, um, they release the project that they already have participated and then they can tell what was how they felt about each one of the projects or uh, what was the impact and if there was any impact or not because um, and uh, who were important in that project for their collaboration and then with that um, with that the triangulation we have a, a different lens that we we don't have in the passive but the passive helped the data that we have um, through the passive network analysis um, also help us to ask uh, I would say deeper questions <laughs> than we yeah, would do yeah. with only having the active. It, but it, it's really wild that you're you're sharing this data back with employees because like it, it it's magical when you actually put a network map in front of people and that they know that they're in it and they can find themselves. <laughs> uh, you, you know, like it, it, yeah. it's 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 absolutely wonderful. Leader, leaders love it. Individual employees because they, they want to go find themselves and where they are on the map. It can also lead to issues as well, where um, say someone is like further on the periphery of the math than they expected, you know, uh, and it's like, well, you know, I'm not as connected to the center as I should be or this sort of thing. But th that, that can lead to issues where say like a research scientist, I'm a research scientist. If I had as many like calls as like a salesperson, I would fucking shoot myself. I would never get anything done, you know? uh it, it's a good thing for some people to be on the edge of the network and it's a good thing for some people to bridge groups you don't need 45 people bridging groups and it's sort of the magic of the network map right but everyone everyone loves it everyone loves it it's also dangerous that's all i'm saying i bet you after this podcast is released you're gonna see a slew of people trying to copy the great work that you're doing Hemerson. so i'm glad you're putting it out there in the world but if there was one thing that like one distinct impact or it could be a few impacts that you feel like this has had directly on the business that you are the most proud of what would that be the pieces that i'm more proud of are the personal the, the, the impact that people has in people as well so like scott mentioned we just shared um with with some colleagues that have the job of connecting other people you know and we shared the, the result with them and they see how well they are doing like they have their brokerage score you know, oh, and yeah. th that they get they get satisfaction from that. They feel like we did a good job, you know, in the last two years. Um, and we have colleagues also. We talk to them about this form of work, and they 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 say that that changed the way they they work all together. In, in the past, they would be passive, waiting for some um, requests from the line manager. Now they know that they can develop their career in any direction they want just but they need to be active they need to take ownership for it and uh, they are doing that's what uh, changed the life of many people instead of they said okay that's there is only one career path for me one one journey now they see many other options um, they can contribute with the skill that they have and they can develop new skills for impactful work and this is testimonial that we get uh, from our colleagues this is what i'm more, most proud of I mean, you know actually changing individual employees lives yes we could win Change. a miss america pageant right I here love it. changing people's <laughs> lives <clears throat> you know what one just to 
<laughs> kind of switch gears here, here for a second. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I, I found out in preparation for this podcast, Emerson, was that there were no waffle houses in Switzerland. And so what we wanted to do, we knew you were a fan. We wanted to dust off an old Confusion Matrix segment called the Waffle House. The Confusion Matrix. So do you do you have a Waffle House for us today, Scott? Uh, I mean, like in honor, in honor of Hemerson, we'll, we'll call it the Stroop Waffle House, right? <laughs> Stroop Waffle House. <laughs> right? No waffle houses. I mean, like, okay, just get good, good, good do, do pancakes or waffles just very quickly. Yeah. I actually had to Google first time I heard if you guys talk about this in the podcast. And what is this? Is, is it a real <laughs> shop? Is it a real brand? Waffle it, houses? It, it's absolutely <laughs> magical. Cole, Cole owned one at one point. I did not own one. This is not true. <laughs> All right, Emerson. All right, Emerson. The, the rules are simple. You know, you just kind of waffle on a topic. And the topic today is either take a friend on a family vacation or join your friend on their family vacation. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, both. Oh, you just, want, <laughs> you just want all the vacations. You said vacation. That's only the, the only thing I heard. Friend and vacation. That's... <laughs> 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 which which is better though? Like which, which you which would you prefer? Mm, I I can deal with all the dysfunctional families well, so I think I probably would join his family. But I don't know if it, he or she can deal with my family. Oh, <laughs> so, so it's safer. <laughs> yeah. See, I was thinking like home turf advantage sometimes is is better. Like, do you want? It's like well, like I feel like on a vacation. There's always this moment if it's very dysfunctional that, you know, one group just says, screw it. I'm going off and doing my own thing for a little bit. And I feel like you have more kind of ability, autonomy to do that with your own family than if you're with somebody else's family. Um, So I don't know. That's kind of my thinking. What's your perspective, Scott? But boy, it is it is a waffle, right? So like if you have someone else as a guest with your family, like, you know, you know, the nuttiness of your own family and the idiosyncrasies. Mm-hmm. And like, I feel like you're always playing defense, right? You're mm-hmm. always like trying to guard or like trying to pretend like you're normal when, you know, you're not, <laughs> but you're not, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, and, and you know, the pitfalls that are like going to get you in trouble, this sort of thing. Uh, I, I, I could personally like, blend in with another family but then like once you start seeing that they are not the people that you expected or, or like they're not into the same things that you you were envisioning you just kind of want to get away right i think you've said this before scott where like traveling with other people is like the best way to find out about like their character or like whether you would hire someone or something like that. And uh, <laughs> oh, that's just think, the actual process of traveling, like going through the airport. Oh, uh, okay. The, I thought it wasn't like you're actually on the vacation with them. Oh uh, well, I mean, I have found like for as an adult, friends traveling with them, and just be like, uh, you know, it, maybe y'all want to go to bed at eight p.m. Whereas, like, hey, we're going to, you know. You know I go to the club all the time, Cole. We're going to party. Yeah, like, like lean into it, man. We're we're going out. I, yeah, I I think it's it's a good thing. We, uh, traveling with people, going through the process and all the unforeseen situations, and see how people handle. Yeah, and, you know, flights canceled and queues and uh, and your your seat your assigned seat is not is occupied by another person. That really when you get to know people. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, absolutely! You put a little cognitive load on them and a little a little strife, and just watch watch them. <laughs> yeah, you want to see somebody lose it? Just have somebody else sit in their seat on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 if, what if like your friend that you're bringing along like is kind of a jerk, Emerson? Like he's they they're, they're just, they got a bad attitude. Shit, you are doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really we, tough. We, we, gotta, we gotta make it tough. <laughs> well, you, you gotta waffle. That's my... why you waffle at the waffle. Yeah, house. S- s- someone sits in their seat. They start getting a bad attitude. They start like griping at you, and you're like, "Damn, I'm with my family here, and you're being a jerk." Yeah, that's why I would be with his family. Then oh, okay, I... you can be the jerk. 
Yeah, I can be the jerk. <laughs> Better to be the jerk than to have to protect someone from others being jerks, I guess, is exactly. the conclusion. And, and then what can I do if my family is acting like that? Huh? Yeah, like, that's uh, the thing. You always got to play defense. That's much worse. <laughs> yeah. But I, I remember Absolutely. as like a kid, like going to other families' house and just seeing how they like handle, say, like, you know, family dinner. It's like, wow, you guys just do things differently. You just walk mm -hmm. into a house and like just. It's, it's the wow. same motions, but it's different. Yeah. My parents were like really strict and stuff. So every time friends would come over, it would be like, whoa. <laughs> Dude, we're we're doing this. This is happening. You know, like, yep, this is what we do every night. Yeah. This is why I am the way I am. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> well, well, Hemerson, I know you're a fan of the pod. You uh you like you want to do some nerdery? You like you like the nerdery section? Yeah, it's a scary session. <laughs> it's a That's scary just scary. Session. Yeah. The nerdery. Why is it scary? But you guys take stuff from I don't know where. <laughs> Some very good stuff that later I, I read it. But I said, why wow, these guys get this stuff from? <laughs> it's like, it's it's yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So so you're a, you're a listener. We we don't really get feedback that often. Like, are you more of a interview guy? Do you do you enjoy the first half of the pod or more like the second half, the nerderies? I um I think you guys bring a lot of good things to Nuttery as well. That's why I was it's just scary for me being here, but I love when, when you put a lot of people on it. <laughs> so I like both parts. Um yeah, when you have very good um guests, it's we learn so much from both parts because um you, you put them in spot on, on tough stuff. Well we find that people are uh, one or the other. They they're either interview people or uh nerdery people. Yeah, for sure. Oh. It's uh yeah. You know, you got to take what you can get, though, right? Um, but I think the first one we have, uh, Scott, is is for you. I thought this is a, actually a, a pretty cool find about burnout contagion amongst teachers. I don't know. Do you want to intro it? I figured you're going to go the one that's like, never go first. It seems natural. <laughs> that's actually, a, I'm sorry, dude. That was teed up for me, and I just didn't even do it. Sorry. Here, you're a little to switch gears. Here, I'll I'll do the never go first, just because I got to do that. All right, let me let me share that one. Hold on, give me a sec. So this is order effects in the results of song contest. So uh, the authors essentially noted that uh, during these like song competitions, they it's called like Euro Star or something like that. Euro Euro Invasion. Uh, where the or the contestants predicted their final rankings, but in the reverse order, so that the later you go in the contest, the more likely you are to receive a higher rating. And I, I this the, it should be random. It should be just kind of all over the place. But you know, someone <laughs> decided to investigate this, and they found that not only did the expert judges rate people uh, lower that went first but also the television audience. So the non-experts sort of fans in the audience. Uh, so the final takeaway is uh, it's there. Int this introduces inefficiencies in the system. And uh, if you're ever in sort of like a situation like this, which we encounter quite frequently, you shouldn't go first. You shouldn't go first. Do you think that holds over to job interviews? I, I think it holds over to job interviews. Uh, absolutely. Like, so think about like, so you want to be last because I always heard there was like primacy bias, which was the bias for the first candidate. And then the recency bias, which was the bias yeah. for the last candidate. But it, it sounds like this is saying that recency bias strongly outweighs going earlier in the process. I, th I think it's a calibration effect, right? So like when you first, like you need to hire for a role, uh, just uh, role X and you start getting, uh, resumes in and you're re reviewing them and like that first one's like oh well they don't they're not even remotely qualified then like after you start reading a few more it's like oh my god no one's like remotely qualified <laughs> 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 but this this uh 12th one i looked at they look pretty good or they will suffice you know yeah that's yeah, fa that's I, fascinating I and I think you remember most as well the last ones, right? You remember the worst one, it's like, and you remember the last ones or the remember the, the, the very best moments, but you the, the the impression will be stronger on the last one. And I think in contests like everyone 
have heard all the first um, contestants in the music and they say, okay, let's, let's stay. <laughs> none of them is good. Yeah. <laughs> as you say, Scott, none of them is good. But then as you get in the, for the last <laughs> ones, you say, okay, maybe these ones are better, you know, they must be better because they are the last ones, you know, they put it in the sequence because they're best. I think you just need like, you just need to warm up too. Like I remember grading exams in grad school. Like they give like a stack of exams, or you know, like uh, uh, papers or whatnot. And the first ones you're like, no, no, <laughs> X. Then over a while, like the grading just kind of eases, and we just, you need to go back and regrade the first ones just because it's not yeah. fair at that point. But I mean, it has it, it has implications for like uh, say like if you're going to present. Uh, uh, alternatives to a senior leadership. Mm -hmm. Like, here's one alternative. Here's another alternative. Here's another one. Uh, that first one may not be the best based on perceptions, but it may be. You know, they will not even remember the first one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's the thing. laughs> Depends on the time. Okay, I remember the last one, and then you put three by three, the, the, the three in a in a in a slide. Uh, they will only rem they will remember better the last one. That's it. Why at least Absolutely. that's a strategy. This is, I mean, I, I, as as you guys are talking about this, I'm I'm sitting here thinking, this has really profound implications. <laughs> like on, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm like, and I wonder how many things in you know our lives or just a random person out there's life were impacted either in a positive way or a negative way just by pure ordering effects of you know trying to get a promotion or trying to get a job or trying to you know get on a board of a committee or something like that like anything that had to, some kind of selection effect to it and oh man that is just it, it it introduces like one of the things i always tell people if they're looking to get a promotion at work and it's not exactly aligned to this but i say it's how you perform it's what people say about you when you're not around and luck and happenstance and this absolutely falls under the luck and happenstance thing. You don't have any control over what order you go in, generally speaking. And so, man, that's it's just so crazy how things like this can really make profound impacts on someone's life. I mean, th this is where something like uh, AI can really help. Like, say, like uh, automatic weeding of resumes, you know, it's like grading a through c or whatever and where like you essentially ban the resumes so all these are going to be the same it doesn't help in the order that people actually review them but maybe it does uh, uh level some playing field as far as actual qualifications yeah wow yeah and assign the and assign the interview schedule randomly as well <laughs> <laughs> Do the last one have a better chance <clears throat> right <laughs> always go last always go last well it is the beginning of the year so hopefully we just kind of came off some holidays hopefully we're not feeling that burned out but, <laughs> you would but do burnout like, now so let's do some burnout now <laughs> do some burn call leading us into it like a pro like, okay, i'm trying like i'm doing, doing my best so uh, burnout is thought to be contagious, but it's obviously difficult to study um, from an individual perspective, actually just, you know, asking people what they say on a uh, survey, this sort of thing. But this study investigated how interactions among 931 teachers resulted in the transfer of feelings and burnout. Uh, the results show that burnout contagion takes place among strong relationships characterized by frequent interactions and embeddedness in the network. So they actually went out and collected active network data. They asked two questions. I can't remember what they were off the top of my head. But they also asked how frequently do you interact with this person? And embed, embed, uh, embeddedness was measured by, do you have a mutual connection? So like I say Cole, Cole says me, but also a third person in common. So we're both friends with Hemerson as well. So that's actual embeddedness. Uh, buh, 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 buh. anything else here? Uh, emotional contagion is more contagious in these sort of expressive relationships. And interestingly, the feelings lasted for two years There's a two year lagged effect on this thing. And the implications are that, uh, uh, people should think about the social context, uh, for potential feeling negative in strong relationships, but also just adding more social support is not necessarily a good thing because these social support relationships can actually make people feel worse 
because you know they get these sort of like deep ingrained feelings of uh, burnout from their peers. It's really fascinating. Yeah, it's like the cloud hangs over one person and then they interact with another person who's supposed to provide them with support. And then the cloud starts hanging over that person too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How do you fix this? Like to me, the implications of this were quite depressing. (laughs) It's like, like there has to be some kind of wall that you can you know, stop the spread of infection of burnout in an organization. I, I don't know, but it, it just seems like that, like if, well, and it also made me think about the definition of like, what is burnout? Like is burnout having just a bad day or is burnout uh, having 10 bad days in a row? Like, and, and so I, I started thinking about this as like, this is fascinating. And how much impact does one human being have on another? And it sounds like a lot. And so I, I, I was very curious about this. <clears throat> Especially um, negative, right? Negativity mm-hmm. spreads faster. Um, feelings of, of um, sorrow or sadness go faster as yeah. well through the embedded network. <clears throat> I think the best thing is for people to seek. Uh, although this, this report say people do not should not seek support, what, what I think is not necessary from those close to them, who are also affected by the same context. They yeah. kind of need to open their mind or experience something that from different context. Um, that's why I think also is important to have all the networks, right? Be part of all the social systems. Um, like we do, we do have these communities, um, hobbies or like in the diving club we do is, it's, it's a, a little bit to balance that, right? We, we, we meet, when we meet, we never talk about work. It's more fun, you know. <laughs> and people, if you are depressed, they, they they do that exactly to forget the conditions that they are going through. Um, I, I think, I think that, that's, that's kind of absolutely critical, support. right? So you know, people get caught up in these sort of echo chambers without an outlet, and it just becomes a self reinforcing sort of thing. Alex Pentland talks about this uh, that you know you get these sort of hurting behaviors, and this is like just another form of hurting behavior is people just you know feeling shitty together essentially and just make <laughs> spinning it up and just you need like to, this podcast just like this podcast. <laughs> and you need to like break it you need to break that up like you know it's like you should you guys should not be talking go go to the diving club go talk to somebody that doesn't care about these sort of things yeah, uh I, it, I, it, I actually it, sorry scott go on. no 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 yo, please continue i i was gonna say i actually have um I, I keep track of my interactions and I, I, there are people that um, they give me energy. And then when I'm starting to feel a little down, these are the people that I'm going to reach out. It's oh, not or even to work, like have a coffee, let's have a chat. Because after that, I get energized. We may, I may not even talk about what's annoying me. It's just that interaction that it's energizing. And uh, I know that I need to, that from time to time. You know, and I think it could be a strategy, you know, keep track, I love organize your calendar so as well around the energy. <laughs> I love that so much, like what you get from the people around you, because I mean, like we get so much or, you know, unfortunately catch so much as well. Right. I mean, there's nothing worse than like um, the, the, the co-worker that walks in with, with a dark cloud, like Cole mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. like, and like every day, you're like walking on eggshells. It, it's really a disservice to everyone around them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really, really insidious what these people can do to the entire office, really. Yeah. No kidding. When I think like there's a part of me that, that says that there's like only like two weapons in this fight. One is you have to lead with empathy in the sense, if somebody is having a bad day, you know, or yeah. just having a hard time in life, it's important to be empathetic to that. But there, there's also the, the the secondary weapon is like, we all, the onus is on ourselves too, to like, if there are kind of like, like non-structural components to why we're burned out, can we try to fix those too? Now, and then I guess there is really like a third onus, which is like, if there's structural components to why people are burned out, the responsibility lies on the organization or the person's manager or whoever to remove those structural barriers. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes like the, the reasons why people are burned out are completely outside of their control. Yeah. Um, it, it has um, implications for how we approach, say, like teams, like small mm-hmm. interconnected groups that uh, self reinforce and, 
it, this is a great uh, like Hemerson. They, they they've mapped the entire organization, and now they can just like essentially color color the nodes by how burnt out they are. And uh, FYI, they, they're using what I suspect is um, uh, the lower end or the reverse score of engagement because they they reference Bakker and Insiglu and these sort of engagement folks, but they never say that in the article. So that's why I suspect that they're using as a measure of burnout. Are you saying they're plagiarizing Scott? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I would, no. If, no if you, I'm, I'm messing around. <laughs> if you borrow from one person, it's plagiarism. But if you borrow for a bunch of people, that's research. Right? So. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's how that's that works, it. but I think you have to talk to people. <laughs> no, that's a quote from somebody. I don't know who said that. It's not original. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we, we do have one more nerdery topic, which is completely unlike the, the last two um, that we put in here. Let me, let me pull it up real quick, but it's about um, it's from the proceedings of the national Academy of sciences about projections of human kinship for all countries. And just for like, cause I feel like that's kind of a reserve term in industry. What they mean by kinship is like family size. Um, and so what they're doing is projections into the future. Um, and, and those people who, who listen to me or have been reading my writing know that from a workforce planning perspective, I've been all over this demographic change thing that's been going on in society. And this is another article that kind of represents that. And so they found that demographers have long attempted to pro project future changes in the size and composition of populations of basically the world. And one of the things that they found is demographic changes are happening very rapidly. And, and, and one of the examples that they used is a 65-year-old woman in 1950 could expect to have 41 living kin. But according to their projections, a 65-year-old woman in 2095 is expected to only have 25 living kin, which represents almost a 40% decline. And so this really has... Um, kind of like a double-edged effect on society. One of the things that the, the authors find is that because kin supply is decreasing, it's going to put um, <clears throat> pressure on both the bottom end of the uh, spectrum in terms of taking care of children and the top end of the spectrum mm. because there's gonna, you're going to see a huge balloon in great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents that we've never seen before, but there's going to be less people beneath those great, great grandparents to take care of them. And because you would think that, oh, grandparents can often help with children and raising children. But once you get past a certain point of feebleness, you're you're no, you're only you're having to take care of children, but also, you know, elderly uh, or elderly relatives as well. And so this is going to have profound implications societally not just in the united states but everywhere in the globe according to these offers and so i thought this was fascinating not just from a societal perspective but the impacts that this is going to have on the workplace for you know how do we deal with elder care how do we deal with child care and the types of in benefits that employers provide and the types of flexibility they provide and i know we've been on you know the work from in the office work from home kind of debate off and on and and so I don't know what what perspectives did you guys have on this article? When you when you pop and and uh, actually I saw this summary, it sounds very much like what's already happening in China. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I, I I worked in China for um, seven years, and and that was the situation people would report, and they would have demographically they would they would have to work, take care of their kid, and uh, there are four grandparents uh, that they have to. To take care and they usually would live in the same house um which which could be one of those scenarios is called like you bring a friend yeah <laughs> you're on vacation to your family and then you have all your grandparents there um it is um it has implications and in, in considerations for how um empathetic you are which kind of benefits you provide um when we are in china we we were one of the companies that or we attract a lot of people because of we provide already a, a lot of flexibility and that support uh, for um, the elders as well. I mean, for not not directly, but we, people could then take the time to visit the parent, the grandparents, and the parents, and take care. And they could move in the same um, the same house. We provide support for that as well. 
um, that was already a differential for, for us. We didn't pay best, <laughs> but people would like join the company because of, of that kind of human consideration. Yeah, it, it's it's a wild scenario, and I th I think you're right, Emerson. Like we're we're already starting to see this. When I it probably stems from say, uh, birth control is probably stemmed started it off where mm -hmm. people no longer have children in their you know early twenties. It's more like winter thirties or now even you know a little bit yeah. later than that. Uh, and therefore you just have fewer children overall, which you know obviously leads to this sort of impact. Uh, but you know, aside from say like the economic impact that this is going to have from like uh, the workforce, et cetera. I mean, it has implications for uh, the things that like Cole alluded to, like the social support that's provided to uh, say grandparents or, you know, children, which will lead to societal norm changes and how people interact with one another and what they expect as, as far as like their family relationships. And, I, I, I like I think about this like the idea of like friends giving or like Thanksgiving where people just get together with their mm -hmm. friends now as opposed to with their family. That, that's like one societal sort of thing that mm -hmm. um, it, it just like, it shows us like a shifting landscape and how people interact with one another, with their family, how they care for them. Um, no, I, and I think about like things like even societal policy. You guys mentioned China, you know, for an extended period of time, they had a one child policy. Yeah. Right. And that that had I think at the time I, I'm, I'm assuming the reasoning was, you know, trying to curb, you know, exponential growth of the population or something like that. But it has long lasting impacts in the sense it's creating a lot more elderly folks than the children to take care of them. And so yeah. but, you know, as as far as I can tell, birth rates around the entire globe are decreasing even without a, like a one child policy. So maybe what happens in China is kind of a a leading indicator to what might happen in other parts of the world. Um, and so I think it's just a fascinating trend to watch as a society. And, you know, obviously whatever we've done in the past is probably not going to work any longer in the future. So we're going to have to make some substantial changes like to friends giving, you know, like big changes like that. Well, I think that that also stems from like just changes in social support. And like, it's just like the, the remote sort of uh, environment that we work in and live in now. The, you alluded to this, Cole, too, like the remote environment. Now people are more mobile, too. 100 years ago, uh, I, I, I would throw out that 90% of people grew up, lived, and did not leave a probably 25-mile radius. Hemerson's yeah. breaking the mole. He lives in China. He lives in Brazil. He lives in Switzerland. He's all over the place. You know, and I'm you. Have, I'm sure you connect with your family, but it's got to be like a much more remote sort of technology-driven relationship that you engage in. Could you yeah. list all eleven countries like rapid fire, Hemerson? If you had, yeah, to? Let's, let's do this. Oh gosh, um, well, naturally Brazil and China, uh, Thailand, uh, Czech Republic, um, UK, um, Switzerland. Oh no, I don't think I have eleven. <laughs> I, I don't think it will get to 11, man. Um, well, you, my friend, are a liar. <laughs> no, it's, I, I wouldn't remember. Yeah. Wait. Well, you know, I travel to gonna... Japan. Japan. Um, no, I put you on the spot, Hammerson. I was just curious. What, like, did you have a favorite country to live in? Is it is it Switzerland? Is it Brazil? Like, was it somewhere in between? Uh, yeah, Switzerland. In terms of yeah. work work-life uh, balance uh, yeah there's no comparison switzerland i i i like china for the adventure for it was was opening up um, was I, I learned a lot i learned a lot about different cultures um mm. one of the things for it's what i think it is what we are talking about demographics one of the biggest implications is going to be for for us the health care um if you look at it yeah, yeah. Uh, we're yeah. not going to be relying on our our relatives to to have long-term care um, we we're going to be relying on um SEPs providers, you know, that that is is what we see happening there. We saw happening there and it's going to happen everywhere. Um, so for, for that perspective was that was an event that was really um, mind opening to ex experience that different culture. But in terms of life balance, uh, it's still, uh, I, I like I like Switzerland. For, from a, like a, a quasi network analysis perspective, like how, how would you uh, like compare like the collectivistic nature of these cultures and what they oh, yeah. bring 
and so from comparing to China to Switzerland, you would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, like mm. how, how you would deal with them, like what sort of things you would look out for? I, I think there are some, some similar traces in terms of um, uh, community, um, like Switzerland, uh, there is a very strong care about the community to really? the point that people, people um, they are, they feel entitled to tell you off if you were disturbing the community. They don't oh, ask wow. for authority. They don't wait for authority. They will really come and tell you. Yeah, don't something. play loud music in Switzerland. Exactly. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> and if you are insisting, then they call, yeah, they call the police. Mm, and in China, also the, this sense of the, again, back to the family, because it's, it's so strong mm -hmm. and the, 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 uh, it's, it's what the only thing they can rely basically it's that that family and friends um that is also um very strong in china that this is a little bit similar you know that that sense um of community and values of community and community above um something else and i think it, that's why people that um get it wrong it's like in china there is the government but the community the family that comes first um, and in your i see the similar thing in switzerland that's very strong as well yeah, absolutely. That's fascinating. Well, I think this has been a lot of fun, Hammerson. Like you, you've been a fantastic guest. I, I think the work that you all are doing at Roche is just amazing in the ONA space, and I, I've enjoyed having you on. Uh, before I give you the final word, Hammerson, uh, Scott, any final words for for our guest today? Hammerson, thanks for coming on. I'm glad that you're a fan, and uh, I'm glad that we could make this connection. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Well, you've been Thanks listening so to Directionally Correct, a People Analytics podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, Emerson Page. Thanks, Emerson. Thank you, Cole. Thanks, Scott. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. Hey, guys. Directionally Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners, to help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you are helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash directionally correct. Thanks for your support. You've been listening to Directionally Correct, a people analytics podcast with Colin Scott. 